Well, that's the second one made and it came out well, but it was pretty stressful. It's quite a relief to have it done. I didn't have any spare material. I ordered spare insurance material, but it's got lost in transit. Uh, so I still haven't got it, so I'm glad I didn't make a mistake. Um, yeah, really fine tolerances, surface finish, squareness, parallelness. Um, you know, the surface finish requirement for the diameters was 0.2. That's finer than a turned finish. That's that one there, really fine surface finish. Um, and really fine tolerances on lengths and diameters. Just crazy difficult. It scores and scores of machine surfaces that have to hit on specification without a single mistake or the parts are reject. Um, highly stressful, highly challenging work. Anyway, that's done now and I can move on to the next job. And I want to get some time so that I can further develop this uh, prototype I'm working on for a new type of tool setter. And finally the replacement insurance aluminium arrives about nearly two weeks late. So this really underlines the importance to me that you just have to have stock. If you're in a remote area like I am relative to industry, you just have to have a big range of sizes in stock. You need to be able to grab the job and start it straight away to operate efficiently. So it just means you've got thousands of dollars worth of material, steels, aluminiums, brasses, bronzes, you know, the list goes on and on that you have to have stainless steel. If you're doing mainly low volume prototype work, consider picking up a second hand heavy duty vertical bandsaw. I do all my work on this machine, including production cutting of stock, and I have a vise that I use. It's got a gravity powered power feed, and it's very versatile. You can cut virtually anything with it. I bet you can pick up a heavy duty older machine like this Dual in the States for a pretty low price at a auction or a, um, eBay type listing. This one's a, got an infinitely variable speed range. It's got its own um, electric welder on the side. Um, power feed with gravity weights. Um, and you can tilt the table at 45 degrees. And I've got a vise that I can fit on it for uh, doing production cutoff of stock. I buy a roll of bandsaw blading. This is high speed steel uh, bimetal blading. I just buy a big roll, it lasts me for years, and I can weld my own blades here with the little butt welder. Please note I'm not promoting the idea of a, a vertical bandsaw to do everybody's cut off work in every situation. I think my background is fairly unusual in that I started as a tool maker and I needed a bandsaw for the tool making work and as I moved into production uh, and general machining um, I, I adapted it to suit the task and still retain the tool making bandsaw application. Um, but I'm just putting it forward as a possibility for you to consider if you've yet to buy a bandsaw. This option is extremely versatile, um, but I, you know, probably ultimately you want to have also a cut-off bandsaw as well as a vertical bandsaw. And a cut-off bandsaw may be better for your application if you're only doing volume production work. So this setup with a gravity power fed fence pushing a vise allows me to use it for production cutting off of parts it'll run automatically while I'm away doing something else one part at a time I need to load the uh, reset for this for each part so it, it, it'll run automatically for a few minutes during the cut for round stock and so on and I can cut uh, all the parts for the probe this way but I do need to attend to it every few minutes to feed the stock bar through for the next part so when you're making a precision part, 
It's so important to get the datum surfaces parallel and square right at the start. It only takes slightly longer to get that exactly right and then the whole job goes easily and accurately if your basic datum surfaces are accurate. And it's easy enough to get a part parallel or to check it's parallel because you can use a micrometer. But it's not easy to work out whether or not it's exactly square. You know, you put a square on it, a precision square on it, and you look at it through the light and you think, well, it's, it's never perfect, you know, but is that a tenth of a thou triangular gap or is it two thou or three thou? It's really hard to know. And so this is where I love a squareness comparator. I wish I'd had one of these a long time ago. So you can come in and accurately and easily see, you know, where. 20 there on that side, swing it around to the other side, and 20, maybe about 2 microns out. That's a tenth of a thou, a total error out of square. So, you know, you can just so easily measure exactly how square it is uh, and, and have a measurement, not just a triangle of light. So it's a brilliant thing, and I think every shop should have one of these if they're doing precision work, because it's such a low-cost thing, just a base to put your dial indicator on, with a little front curved, what's that called? Rail. So this is a very easy application for a squareness comparator, but it's much more versatile than that. I've, I've got a separate video or two videos on it that I have published or will be publishing. Have a look at that and it'll give you uh, a much deeper insight into how useful and versatile this tool is. A little trick for getting it square if it's not square. I've got a surface grinder, but for aluminium this is often quicker. So your squareness comparator will tell you which way it is. So it's a little bit, for example, a little bit high on that side. Put it down on a bit of, on a ground plate, on a piece of three or 400 grit paper with a bit of kerosene and press down on the high side, less weight on the low side and move it backwards and forwards. I'm doing this with one hand, but you get the idea. Literally only for uh, 10 seconds or so and it'll take off a couple of microns or a quarter of a thou and get it much closer to square than when you put it back on the squareness comparator you should be dialed in. So it's a very quick and ac surprisingly accurate process. My poor old surface grinder is just sitting there redundant now that I've discovered this method for aluminium. It's not a big job to machine this in its rectangular form with a machine with a digital readout, it's not a big job at all. Um, and probably if I had a vertical machining center, I'd do it that way. But because it's only a one and then another one off, I decided not to do this in the Tormac because of the big, long, series, large diameter cutter is practical for this scale of part. I don't think this part's going to move, but I might as well machine a 30 degree internal center there and put a rotating center in there for additional support. You can never be too careful, especially as you get further into the job, you've invested more and more hours in it, you don't want to start again. In case you're interested in the surface roughness standards comparator, you can buy these little tools, a flex bar composite pocket set number 16008, for example, gives you the different uh, examples of uh, surface finish in uh, lapping, reaming, grinding, horizontal milling, vertical milling, and turning. So when you get your drawing specified out with certain required surface finish, it's nothing like having a comparator that you can look at it and say, okay, I'll see where they're coming from. Um, because, you know, the designer that specifies it puts, puts a premium on the work if they ask for a high surface finish. Um, for example, this part was in a 0.2. So that's not even a turn finish. That's a, a lapped finish. And the finest turn finish is a 0.4. That's in metric this scale here, UMRA. 
So just in case you're interested in that, a very useful little tool if you're looking for uh, a, another addition to your kit. There's another gauge put, put out by Eurospark for uh, the surface finish of different spark eroded or EDM surfaces as well. But this probably won't be very useful for most of you. Well there's another tricky part I've just finished in bronze this time. Two millimeter metric threads. And that's always scary because those little taps snap very easily. Luckily it's not aluminium bronze. Aluminium bronze would be a real scary proposal. Don't forget to consider a faceplate for setting up tricky machining operations. You can set it up in its horizontal state and uh, that makes it a lot easier because you haven't got the issue of gravity shifting the part and clamps. And when you've got it roughly right, just nipped in position, you can put it into the lathe for dialing it in. And here I'm using a faceplate to bore a high precision cross hole in the shaft. Um, you can get extreme accuracy using a faceplate in a lathe because the tool is being moved by the slideways of the machine and the parts being moved by the spindle and so you're generating the accuracy uh, with the with that geometry rather than relying on the accuracy for example of an end mill which is forming the accuracy and you never get the same sort of accuracy by, by forming but with a lathe set up it takes quite a bit longer to set it up because you've got to dial in opposing geometry on both sides and tap it around and it takes quite a bit more work and a bit more caution holding the part because it's spinning round and yet you don't want to hold it so hard that you damage it at all. If you'd like to see more of this type of video, please remember to like and subscribe. That will help with the YouTube algorithms and uh, make it more readily available for other viewers. Thank you. All right, thanks for watching, guys. Cheers.